man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. This is Matthew chapter 6 in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light is, that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Let's pray for the sermon. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your incredible love for us uh, and the gift of this word. We ask you now to open it up for our, uh, us and our minds and hearts and you will inspire my speaking and our hearing so that we will hear the words of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much in Jesus' holy name. Amen. There's a whole class of people, um, in fact, there's a, a new acronym for it, FOMO, which is fear of missing out, and that people will spend inordinate amounts of time doing things that they perhaps normally wouldn't do and investing that time, investing their money and their resources, just for the sake that they won't miss out on what everybody else has got. So that's the case with mobile phones where um, the, the mobile phones uh, are, are everywhere and people will go and get the latest one, even though they've got one that's two years old and it's perfectly fine. Well, they'll go and get the latest and the greatest and spend uh, $2,000 on that, on a plan that they're, they're forking out every month for, on the fear of missing out on the best, latest version with all the latest little gadgets and social media tricks and tools and whatever that they could have in order to, quote, stay connected to the world. And if you think about what is actually happening when people are investing all that time and their money and, and in all kinds of other things, really that fear of missing out, the operative word there, that fear, is really active for so many, isn't it? Fear is what's driving them. And... What is it that people will ultimately fear? Well, they will fear that their hearts are not full, that their lives are not full, and um, that, that they can make, not take every opportunity that life will afford them. And particularly when you do not have a view that includes God, that includes his promises, then that fear revolves around this life, everything that is in front of you, the earth, everything that is in front of you is what counts because I'm going to live, I'm going to die. Some people think maybe I'll some kind of somehow continue on in the cosmos and some consciousness or whatever. I don't know how they justify how that happens without God, but they do that. And then say, but now is the time that I need to maximise. So therefore everything is ploughed into the now so that they can feel like they have a full life. And, and of course, by doing so, ironically, what they miss out on is actually a real full life, a real full life that is without fear, that is without anxiety, and that is actually filled with a love that is far, far greater than anything that any one individual could ever build. And that's the love, the treasure, the reward, that is with our Father in heaven and with Jesus Christ, his Son. Now, we're on part three of basically these verses uh, that describe treasuring up for yourselves treasure, not on earth, but treasuring up for yourselves these treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where it doesn't get eaten up by vermin, where somebody does not dig in and steal what it is that you've stored away, but that you store your treasures in heaven and therefore if you do so your heart will be there and vice versa that if your heart is there then you will store up for yourselves as treasures in heaven 
and we looked at a number of examples last time from the scriptures uh, about that very process. And of course, uh, David, we we're talking about. But there's so much here. There's so much that Jesus has built into these statements regarding the way our hearts work, right? The way the human heart works. It is a mystery to people. There are courses, there are all kinds of things that people undertake lifetimes in order to try to unravel the mysteries of the human heart. Jesus is here in this sermon describing what that is, what is involved in our hearts and minds, and how to latch onto something that is permanent, not something that is impermanent, that is transitory, that will fade away. So the questions that we arrived at at the end of last time was, okay, if we go through the, the, a number of other aspects, so we get to this, the question of how do you treasure up your treasures in heaven today and also what are those treasures in heaven that God has set aside or is setting aside? So what I'm going to do is go through quite a bit of different examples from scriptures that describe for us how we can, on the practical level, remembering the Sermon on the Mount is practical, how on a practical level can we treasure up treasures in heaven. So the first one is this, um, that we treasure up for ourselves treasures in heaven by seeking and following, as Jesus would say later on in this sermon, the kingdom of God first and his righteousness. And that means pursuing the will and the mission of God. And what is his mission? His mission is to establish his kingdom on earth, his special kingdom, right? That, that it will not just be in heaven, but that it will be on earth and then go out from there. And right now he does that not through, um, not through ancient Israel, not through the ancient the temple as we looked at before with David, but he does that through the church and its ministry, the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ is how he is building his kingdom. And on a very practical level, that ministry always needs to be supported. If you turn to Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, in verse 1, did you know that Jesus had a support crew? Jesus and the disciples had a support crew. Um, I know this is commented on in various contemporary kind of TV shows like The Chosen and so on, um, but uh, historically people tend to just picture the disciples and Jesus walking alone off by themselves. But in Luke chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass afterward that he, Jesus, went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. So that was the message, right? That was the mission, preaching and teaching the glad tidings of the kingdom. And the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, so they had received the blessings of Jesus Christ, including Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna. Now, those other couple of names are not mentioned anywhere else. Yet here, very specifically, Luke, the physician, records people who are not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. But see the function that they serve and many others who provided for him, for Jesus, and actually the, there are various translations that say for them, so for Jesus and the disciples, provided from their substance. So these women who included Herod Steward's wife, so right up there at the top of the government of Israel, the king, that they were providing for Jesus and the disciples. That's food. That's clothing, that's shelter. It's their supply chain as they went out amongst these places. They lived, they had to live off food. And Jesus, as we saw in, in, the, um, in his battle with Satan, he didn't turn around and say, well, I'm going to take stones and I'm going to make them into bread for myself. No, he lived like a human being. And he does his ministry, his work through human beings like you and I. And they need to be sustained. That's why in the, in the prayer it says, give us our daily bread. 
But here these people, these women, are forever recorded as having treasured up treasures in heaven by sustaining the ministry of Jesus Christ. What an incredible privilege. I mean, if you thought about that, how much would you love to have your name sitting there for all time recorded as being one of those ones who supported him through his, through his earthly ministry? I mean, that's, a, that's absolutely amazing. And it's not, it's not men's names that are listed here. It's women for all time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul makes these comments to the Corinthian church. Now, just to explain some context, what happened was that in Corinth, it appears like there were basically these guys who called themselves super apostles, that they were absolutely amazing rhetoricians and speakers, and they had uh, great intellect and, and so on and presence. And they supported themselves by being paid by the churches that they visited. And so people would actually say, well, we paid him a really high fee, therefore he must be a great apostle. Now, Paul did not do that in Corinth. He was not supported by them. And here's what he says in verse uh, uh, 4 of 1 Corinthians 9. Well, in fact, verse 3 says, My defence to those who examine me is this, because what was happening is they said, look, you're, you're, you're not worth the fee, so clearly you can't be a great apostle because we didn't pay you a high fee. But he says, well, my defence is this. Do, do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord, uh, so that would include Jude and James and Cephas, that's Peter? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? Do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It is, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who ploughs should plough in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be partaker of the hope. So we work, we want to get paid for it. Of course, that makes sense. You don't work for free. If we have sown spiritual things for you, therefore, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? He said, look, the principle is I should be able to, if I'm working for you spiritually, I should be able to be paid back in material goods. If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? People are more than happy to pay the carpenter. They're more than happy to pay the plumber. They're more than happy to pay, the, in our day, the lawyer, or well, maybe not happy to pay the lawyer, but they have to pay the lawyer. Um, you know, you pay the doctor, you pay the nurse, you pay all these different kinds of people for their services. Isn't that not even true? Of, shouldn't that not be true of somebody who is providing great benefit, spiritual benefit? And this is why the churches in general have paid pastors staff and so on that run churches you know they get to a certain size they say we can afford it and we are paying those people in some respect nevertheless paul says establishing a principle he says this is the principle but nevertheless we have not used this right but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of christ what we have done is we came and we supported ourselves because we didn't want it to become a barrier between you and us and the gospel. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the temp things of the temple, that is the Levites, the, uh, uh, the priests, they all, they all ate from the offerings of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Even so, the Lord has commanded, so this is God's command, that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. But... I, Paul, have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. So he said, look, here's the principle, but I'm not saying to you, do it to me. I'm choosing not to. That's my prerogative. If I wanted to, that would be right. I don't want to. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. And here's my boasting. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of if... Uh, sorry, if I preach the gospel, 
I have nothing to boast of for necessities laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. Well, what's my reward then? Well, my reward is that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge, without fee, no cost, that I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. So what Paul is saying is, I do it because I want to, because I, I, I feel compelled to. I have to preach the gospel. Nothing's going to stop me from that. I'm not going to, my boasting then is in the preaching of the gospel, not that I get paid, because in my mind for you, particularly the Corinthians, if I get paid for it, then I'm, doing, I'm going to end up doing it out of duty, and I don't want to do it out of the duty. I don't want to do it because I'm a paid employee. I want to do it because I love the gospel, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. Paul worked as a tent maker. It was a very valuable profession. When he made tents, he made good money off of it, and it financed his journeys. And he had others like Pris Priscilla or Prissa and Aquila, a husband and wife team, who were also tent makers that worked with him, supported the ministry. And he had other people that worked together and supported the ministry. And then he comments at other times that other churches would support their ministry as well. So he wasn't just working all the time, but particular churches, he said, I'm going to support myself in this instance because I want to and I don't want it to become a barrier. I don't want money to become something in between you and me. Um, this is in First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, a similar situation with the Thessalonians where he says, For you remember, brethren, our labour and toil for labouring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preached to you the gospel of God. So it was combined. He worked so that it wouldn't become a burden on the church, that they wouldn't feel like, hey, he comes in here, he's preaching, and now he wants to live off us, even though that would be perfectly justifiable and right and good. But he didn't, and he doesn't. Uh, you know, he didn't uh, so many of the times. Um, but he did accept it from others. Now, um, I'm not going to belabor it, but just to mention it because it's in context, that's the situation in which I am in, right? I'm not saying these things so that you can turn around and then start trying to support me. Exactly the same as Paul is saying. This is the principle. We have a church, as it grows, I do, we, we will have financial needs. You know, we'll have needs in terms of the venue, um, you know, the, the websites, equipment, supporting other people. We want to use that money to support the members of the church as well as giving to the poor and so on. All of those are important. So we will have financial needs as we, as, as, and we do and as we continue on. But you give as you, as you are able to and as you wish to. I'm not asking for it for personal income at all. This, uh, my, my, my privilege is to be able to do what, what Paul says. When I, when I earn money, I earn good money, and it can pay and it can provide for us. And Mary and I make that choice in our work and everything. So, and that is my intent going forward, all right, for, for, for as long as possible. So um, please understand, I'm not trying to, uh, you know, say some kind of change in policy or anything like that. We give as we are able. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, here's the other principle that um, Paul says here. So he's saying back to the Corinthians, talking about gifts because they've, they've started offering for various needs. And this is 2 Corinthians verse, uh, sorry, chapter 9, verse 5. Is there, uh, he says, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go, ahead, to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand for the other churches. It wasn't for Paul. It was to support other churches, which you have previously promised that it may be, read, uh, may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. So here Paul in his letters is actually talking about financial matters, collections and so on to support various churches. The Corinthian church said, we, we want to help support other churches. And he said, great, what a beautiful promise. So I'm sending people on ahead with, with this letter and so on to prepare it so that when I come, it'll all be ready and we can take it and we can provide it for others. Um, but this I say, verse 6, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This is what Jesus is saying. Where, are, where is your treasure? Where do you put your treasure? So let each one gives as he purposes in his heart, 
not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God, so you give, but then God is able to make all grace abound to you toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. So the principle there is he's saying, but God can also support you so that you can continue to give. That's the idea. Right, so hopefully you will be abundant. And certainly my prayer is that for all of you, that you'll have great work, you have great careers, and you'll have you know, excellent income, and that you will give um, for God's ministry to the, of the word and to the poor. And then that's the, the next point I want to make, is specifically regarding the poor. We heard it earlier on in Matthew chapter 6, where Je what Jesus said. But if you turn to Luke chapter 14... Here's part of what Jesus said when he's at dinner with some very rich Pharisees. This is Luke chapter 14 and verse 12. Jesus said to him who invited him. Uh, Jesus would never shy and retiring when it came to telling people the truth. He says this, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbours lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. Right, so he's talking here about the motivation. Don't invite others so that you can, you know, be chummy and get back into the, the circle of, of, uh, of rich, expensive dinners. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. This is treasures in heaven. This is another way that we treasure up treasures in heaven because we give to those who cannot give back. You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you should, shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. God is keeping a reward for our good works towards others reserved in heaven that he will repay. That's Jesus' plain words. When does it happen? At the resurrection, when he returns. And we give in secret, as he said earlier in the, uh, in the sermon. Now, another aspect is this, and you can turn on uh, over the page to Luke chapter 16 and verse 9. Now, Luke chapter 16, at the beginning of the, the chapter, is talking about the parable of the unjust steward, um, who uh, you can see how shrewdly he used money in order to set up a life for himself after his uh, master wanted to, wanted to sack him. Now, in verse 9, he, he, Jesus gives one of the lessons of this because what happened was that the unjust steward took his, owner's, uh, his master's money and paid off a bunch of, um, of, of people with it so that he could have favour with those people after his master let go of him. In verse 9 it says to you, and I say to you, this is Jesus directly commenting, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mam mammon. Another way you can use your goods is to, quote, buy friends within the gospel. Because when you fail, that is when you pass, when you die, they may receive you into an everlasting home. By investing in the gospel, by investing in other people, by investing in the poor and so on, what we are doing is that we are helping to create friends for the kingdom of God. It's, it's in one sense kind of mercenary, but that's why Jesus says it. That's why he's using this parable. It says he's shrewd. Invest your time, your resources and so on to bring other people into the gospel, you're, you're creating for yourselves friends in heaven, in the kingdom of heaven forever. This is backed up in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where we were. Um, and this is in verse, uh, verse 9, that Paul again is talking about his work. And he says, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. 
According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master of builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. Remember we looked at the story of David building the temple last time? Paul is here saying, you are now building the house of God. Every bit of your time that you invest in it is building the house of God, the temple of, of eternity. No other foundation can anyone lay, however, than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's at the base of it. But if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, the day being the Christ's return and the judgment day, the day will re declare it because it will re be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And what he's doing here is emphasising that salvation is still the free gift of God, but there are, there are rewards for our work. It's a great principle. God doesn't have to do that, but he wants to. Second Corinthians chapter six, going on from there. Second Corinthians six and verse sixteen, uh, he says this. Right again about the temple. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Uh, the, sorry, this is verse sixteen. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. So we are engaged in the building of the temple and the people are the temple. The church is the temple of the living God. Now, another is Matthew chapter 25. I won't read through it in detail, but this is a parable of the talents because one of the things, again, is it does is show us how do we uh, practically in, invest in the kingdom this is a parable of the talents, Matthew chapter 25. It starts in verse 14, but I'm just going to summarise it. The kingdom of heaven is like a, the, a man travelling to a far country. So this man goes to a far country. He calls his servants to them. He gives them talents to use on his behalf, and the talent meaning uh, a load of, uh, uh, of wealth, of material wealth. And they did various things with it. One went and hid, uh, dug a, a hole in the ground and hid it away. And um, another uh, had two and got two back. Another had five and he made another five talents with it. He traded it. Then what happened was that the Lord, in this case, returned. Again, resurrection of the just. The Lord returned and he said, well, what did you do with your talents? And they all gave an account. And he said to the one... Here's an interesting thing about the rewards. He said, the one said, um, Lord, you've delivered to me five talents, I've got five more. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. And that's important in terms of considering what the reward is, which we'll look at again in a moment. The same with the one of two talents. He said, I'll make you a ruler over many things. But the one who had one talent and had buried it said, well, I was afraid. This goes back to the fear of missing out. He was afraid and he buried the talent. And he said, here it is. It's back to you. There you go. I give you back the talent. And the Lord said, you're wicked and you're lazy. I gave you something I wanted you to invest and you did nothing with it. Therefore, even what you have will be taken away and I'll give it to somebody else. And in fact, he gave it to the one who had earned more. So, and then he says, for, to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. In this case, he casts the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. So this is a, a matter of, and what we can see in many different verses, is that we invest what we have, whether that's physical material wealth or our gifts and our talents, as we use that word today, Right? 
your, your ability to love somebody, to take care of them, to encourage them, those are all gifts that come from God. And we should use those in the service of God towards others. If you have a gift for music, if you have a gift for you know, engineering, um, that you can use those as, as have our members in building something that you want to use to serve God. That's a beautiful investment. And that God says, well done, good and faithful servant. And I know that for, your, you know, that you, that for you've been walking Christian lives and for decades, that every time that you were giving, that's an investment. You're giving of yourself and your gifts, that's an investment in the kingdom of God, that he will say, well done, instead of hiding it away and being fearful. Because the thing is, we can trust God. We can trust him. It says towards, also in Matthew 25, it, says, it talks about the sonning of man coming in his glory. And what does he do in verse 34, his, uh, in 33, he separates the sheep and the goats when he comes. And in verse 34, he says to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. These good works are all laying up treasures for ourselves in heaven. That's the very clear connection. And in Acts chapter 20, it's not recounted in the Gospels, but in Acts 20 verse 35, Paul makes the statement there and he's talking to some of the elders in Ephesus and he said that our Lord had said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that's true in every single way. The more you give, the less fearful for you are, you are, the less anxious you are, the more you set your heart on those things that are important. Lastly, for how we do it, is this principle from John chapter 6, verse 27. So this is John 6, verse 27, where Jesus is talking about um, the food. They're talking about the, the, uh, how he ate. And he says in John 6, 27, do not labour, that is, the word means do not work overly hard for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So lastly, we invest in the treasures in heaven by investing our time, our love, our efforts in Jesus Christ and in the gospel in that way. Mm. If you remember when uh, Martha and Mary were in the household and um, uh, Martha is all fussed because Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his words, and she says, well, come on, come on, come on, help. You know, this, this is the supply chain. She's saying, come on, come and help. You've got to help make everything for Jesus and for the, all the disciples. And she says to Jesus, can you tell her to get up and help me? And he says, it's all right. Ma Mary has chosen the best thing, right, which is to hear my words. Martha, Martha, you are worrying too much. Don't worry too much about those things. Invest in the most important things, which is Jesus Christ and the Father and with the Holy Spirit. So that's how we do it. What are the treasures? What are the treasures of heaven? Now, the, the best way to see this, I think, all in one, is if you turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and what you have here in the first chapter or so is a blow-by-blow blow listing of the uh, blessings of treasures in heaven. This is Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So that's your first one, is that God has given us spiritual blessings. That is a reward. 
is also his gift. That's Ephesians 1 verse 3. A second one is in verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without, without blame before him in love. God gives us a gift of salvation. Then as we continue to grow in him, we are sanctified and we grow. When we put forth some effort in terms of uh, getting close to Jesus Christ, immersing ourselves in the word and in the spirit, and then we grow in the character, the divine nature, as, G as Peter says, of God himself. So part of our reward that is laid up for us in heaven, something that will not fade, is actually our holy, blameless character. That's something that we can treasure. And, you know, if you regard that as a treasure that it should not be touched, then it's so much, easy, so much easier when temptation comes of various descriptions to say, I'm not going to touch that. That's my treasure, the holiness, that blamelessness. I'm not going to corrupt it. I'm not going to let it be corrupted because God's got that reserved for me. I'm not going to wreck it. Then if we skip to verse 7, in him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So the redemption that we have, the forgiveness itself, again, that's God's riches. That's his treasure that he provides in heaven. Verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. The mystery of God, the profound secret, is another treasure. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, in him. Unity with the Father and the Son is part of his treasure. In verse 11, it says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance. That's something that we are gifted, that, we, that, that is going to be given to us. It's an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That inheritance, and I'll just skip over to Romans chapter 8. You don't have to turn there now. You're familiar with the verses. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, that uh, in verse 16 it says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we actually had the inheritance of being heirs of Christ of everything. And it says further on in Romans 8 there, it talks about the creation that has been subjected to futility. Now, even as beautiful as it is, it is not as beautiful as it is going to be under the kingdom of God. And it has been subjected willingly, waiting for the children of God to be revealed in glory at his coming. As John says, we shall... See, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Then back to uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The word is a treasure. The fact that we have this Bible, as we commented uh, uh, a few weeks ago, that there are places in the world where they do not have a Bible even still today at all. The fact that we have this word really available to us is the most incredible treasure that we could ever have on earth. And there were very many times throughout the millennia uh, since Jesus came and since the New Testament was written that many people, many Christians have not had access to this word. They've been forbidden to have access to it. So the fact that we have it is this wonderful gift because in it we see the complete will of God. We have to ask ourselves continually how much do we really treasure that word. Then lastly, verse uh, 13, continuing there, 
Uh, you have heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. The gospel is that treasure. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the guarantee, or the word means like a deposit of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Meaning, the Holy Spirit in us is the down payment that God makes on the full treasure that will be revealed at his return. Colossians 2, he says this, verse 2, he says, uh, or verse 1, I want you to know what a great trouble I have for you and I keep work I have for you and for those in Laodicea, um, as many as not have not seen me, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and to attain to all the riches of of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Every treasure you could seek is actually in Christ and in the Father. And that ultimately is our greatest treasure. It's Christ himself. He is mine forevermore, is the hymn. He is the treasure that we seek. We do not need to fear missing out. He's right there available. He's knocking all the time. He wants us to love him and to be known by him. And that, therefore, is worth giving up all the other treasures. And that's what he says. You've got to be prepared to give it all up if you really want me, because I am the greatest treasure. There are others through time who thought really that this is a case, that, that this treasure is worth more than anything. An example is the great 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon, um, his uh, ministry worked a bit differently. He was paid basically on seat attendance and he was very well known and thousands would come to hear him and he ended up making millions of pounds back in the 19th century. Depends on the estimates you look at, but some estimates will say that based on worth in today's world, he would have been worth a few hundred million pounds based on his preaching. Um, and he gave away every single dollar during his life, or pound, during his lifetime. Gave it all away on orphanages where they, where they raised children to be Christian, they took care of them, on the ministry, on training ministers, on his own church. He would turn around and he would refurbish their whole church based out of his income. All these kinds of things that he would do, he'd spend all that money on the kingdom of God. That was his whole aim. He lived well. He enjoyed it, as we said last time. You enjoy the gifts that God has given you, but he gave all the rest up very happily. Uh, and his wife supported him in that. There are other heroes, though, as well. And if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, we know we can read about this roster of heroes all the time. This is Hebrews 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham. Remember, Abraham was enormously wealthy. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. God promised him that land. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as if in a foreign country. He dwelt in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of, this, of that same promise. So he dwelt like a, an alien, alien and a pilgrim in the land that he was promised. Remember what David said at the end of the giving to the temple in that prayer? He said, we are aliens and pilgrims. Abraham was an alien and a pilgrim in his own country. For what did he do? He waited for the city which has no, which, sorry, the city which has had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Abraham, even having all of that, Look forward to a greater kingdom, a greater treasure than anything he had on earth. In verse 17, it says again, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, his firstborn son, whom he loved so much, who treasured so much, and, who had, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense, you know, because he, 
he, he almost was as good as dead as far as he was concerned, but he was delivered. So he had faith. He did not fear because he knew where the treasure lay and who would keep it safe. God would keep that safe. God would keep Abraham's heart safe. And he did it by faith. In verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. And by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, right? the, the, the Pharaoh, the king of the kingdom of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. So Moses did as well. In verse 32, And what more shall I say, for the time would fail to tell me, of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, they worked righteousness, they obtained promises, they stopped the mouths of lions, they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, they became valiant in battle, they turned to flight, the armies of the aliens, all these things are wonderful. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others, however, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, dens and caves of the earth, and all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. They didn't get the treasure then. Because God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. We shall all receive this gift together. Stott makes this comment that God's inheritance will not be a private little party for each individual, but rather among the saints as we join that great multitude which no man could number. On Thursday morning, Mary and I were in Shane Beach uh, down on the coast and there's these beautiful rocks and the sea crashes into there and looking out across the sea, you look to the edge of the bay but then the seas go on forever to the edge of the world. And up in front of us came a whale, a mother whale, surfaced partly out of the water, all a huge black body, just 20 metres from where we stood, and rose up, and this magnificent mammal rose up, went down under the water, and then its calf then bounced up and jumped out of the water and kept jumping out of the water and the waves as they crashed against the rocks, jumping out, jumping out all along the length and playing and enjoying that beautiful creation, that treasure that God had created for them. And think about, we get to see a glimpse of that mammal and we think how magnificent that, that animal is. And yet there are millions of those under the sea, creatures that we will never see, this vast treasure that God created that we cannot look into at all, but that he's promised that there will be a day when we can. There is no way that man can subdue any of that ocean and make it control it you see the waves you know it's not going to happen on the night time we stood there on the beach and on one side out on that ocean that went to the end of the world a huge lightning storm ran across the entire horizon the lightning is flashing in between all the clouds and on the other side was a mountain down near the end of the, the, the that that southern spot of the Stirling Ranges, and it had its own weather and lightnings and flashings occurring over the mountains. And then immediately above us, where, where we stood between right on the, the, the land of the earth and right next to the sea, above us, it was clear all the way across. And you could see without any of the light or any of those pollution, 
the, the Milky Way stretched out in this incredible band from west all across to the east with the billions of stars out there and the galaxies that you can imagine that are up there as well. And all those vast distances and all its incredible creation framed by these lightnings around us, hearing the crash of the waves right there uh, as we stood and watched and observed. And what came to my mind was Psalm 8. If you remember the, worm, the words of Psalm chapter 8, where it says, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? It says at the beginning of the, that, that psalm, When I look up into the heavens and see the moon and the stars and all that glory, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of the man that you visit him, that you take care of him? For you have made him a little lower than angels. You have crowned him with glory and honour, and you have set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection, under dominion, under his feet. Yet, as I said, there is no way that we can control the oceans. We do not have dominion over the oceans. We can fish there, but that's it. In Hebrews chapter 1, the author repeats Psalm 8, those verses, and then he says this in verse 8, For in that he put all in subjection unto him, he left nothing that is not put unto him. But now we do not yet see all things put unto him. It's not happened yet in the full sense. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, might test death for everyone. And it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Despite the fact that we can see all these things, we know we don't have ownership of them, but Jesus Christ does, and he is the master of all of that. And we are set to be his inheritors and that huge span of the galaxies will become our working ground on into eternity. So we come to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, that's the hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ of the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What is that last time? That last time is that is return, which is what we celebrate on Thursday at the Feast of Trumpets. That inheritance will not be eaten away, it will not fade, it will never be stolen. It is risky. It can be a fearful thing to put your heart somewhere to invest it in something. But if our heart is with our Father in the kingdom of heaven, then it is in the safest, most secure place it can ever be. And when Christ shall come, he shall bring his reward with him, with all of those saints, all of those friends that we participated in, in buying those friends of the kingdom. And then we will truly find that when he is here and when we see him, that our heart will finally have its own everlasting home. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the um, wonderful promises that you have made, uh, the knowledge of the reward that you'll provide, the treasures that you are storing up for us and your, your, the reward that your son will bring. We thank you, Father. We ask you to help us to continue to put our hearts where they really belong uh, in everything we do uh, with you. And we thank you and ask you to, to, to help us in Jesus' name. Amen.